Okay, so how to deal with um, fear and anxiety? Well, I mean, the, the things I would be doing, uh, there's very, various things you can do if you're fe feeling fear and anxiety. I'm going to just talk with different things that can be done. One is being in spiritual groups uh, will help you deal with fear and anxiety because the vibration within those groups will help release, uh, release the fear. Um, also, with um, fear, one of the main things I would do with fear is see how you access fear and how it's experienced for you. So, like, when I, if I experience fear, I'll often, like, try and um, sit, you know, just sit down, close my eyes and become aware of, of the emotion of it and then <clears throat> not label it. So whenever my whenever the the head tries to put a label on it or try to make a description about it or enter into thoughts or stories around it, just detach from those thoughts and just allow the experiencing of of the emotion of it. Even the word fear is a label, so it's just an energy or just an emotion that's being experienced. I think what can happen is that let's say it's you know there's let's pretend there's fear in the stomach or anxiety in the stomach area, if it's there, then just being present to it. And then just um, as one goes into thoughts, just disengage from those thoughts and just be present to and experience what is being experienced. And then you're like deflating the energy. It's like the mm. fear is like, um, it's, just, uh, it's just a pool. It's like a, it's like a container of unresolved, suppressed, repressed energy, which one can label fear. So just as you're being present to it and not going off into thoughts, if you go off into thoughts, just detach from those thoughts and just be present to the energy of it. So you're trying to experience it out. The, what happens is if you allow yourself to go into too much thoughts or stories about it, is that's resistance. So you're not really, it's like the more you're thinking, rather than experiencing the energy of it, the more, the less effective the time is uh, experiencing it because it's like a resistance. You're more identified with the thoughts and the stories rather than just allowing the energy to be experienced and released. Can I ask what is yeah. the energy? The energy uh, for me is, um, well, you know, Asking the question, what is the energy? For me, the, the energy is like, I mean, my guess of what the energy is, is the, um, it's like, why on earth have, are we experiencing duality? And why are we experiencing higher levels of duality? You know, most, more evolved, when I say duality, a real feeling of attachment to the body and the emotions and thoughts. So why are some people experiencing that very, very strongly, i.e. experiencing separation or fear and separation in the body and thinking more strongly, some le after they're doing spiritual work less strongly, and some are enlightened in the non-dual, in the oneness, in the eternal state. So, you know, so why, why is one, or what is, the, what is the fear? Well, you know, I mean, it's quite a big question, but I would, I would sort of frame it today in this way, is that for whatever reason, let's say, uh, karmic reasons, there has been a lot of, um, in the entity, there has been a lot of um, thoughts picked up which are based on falsehood or separation or duality. These comprise the ego. And also, for me, there, there's a habitual thing with the ego to not experience feelings purely. Uh, and especially, uh, I come from an addiction background, so if there are, you know, either I'm in my head or I'm trying to avoid my feelings by doing some kind of activity whereby I never get to experience these energies which build up unless you experience them fully out in every moment. So throughout a whole, ch you know, my view is that I was born with a karmic deficit. And so I had this tendency to like use food. You know, some people might use TV, drinking, drugs, all kinds of things, relationships not to experience the emotions out. So, so that for me is, um, as I sort of see it, each individual has a backlog of repressed emotions or energies 
you know, you, I mean, they're labels, fear, guilt, shame, anger, whatever you want to call, label those emotions, these repressed energies. And the more these energies haven't been experienced out because of, um, if you like, distraction with thoughts or activities which don't allow these to be, then there's a huger accumulation of this, which then creates a lower vibration, meaning that there's a stronger identification with fear and separation and experiencing of fear and separation. So as one does sp uh, spiritual work, then these, there's less, you know, one, one is starting to experience out these repressed energies, shall we say, and one is starting to develop the spiritual tools to not keep habitually identifying with thoughts so that one becomes, it, it starts to ha experience higher spiritual states of consciousness. And so the tendency to be in thoughts and, or to not feel um, is starting to undo the strong experiencing of, of separation or duality. So it becomes more and more weaker. And as you do more evolved spiritual work, it, it, it's released. Is, is that clear or is there something else you wanted to ask with that, with that frame? No. So, so yeah, that's what I sort of see it. So really, it's just the process of developing that attitude. And for me, it's like, well, fear is just means on a certain level that I've not been uh, doing my spiritual practices enough. So it's accumulated. If it's strong fear, then I've accumulated too much. I haven't been doing my regular spiritual practices, like sitting and just trying not to identify with thoughts and just to experience out uh, the energy of it. I like to use the word energy rather than label fear, guilt, shame, or, or whatever. So as I do that, and the thing is, like, if I just do that, that experiencing, and which is for me a very advanced uh, spiritual way of surrender, which is don't I don't try not detach from thoughts when you identify with them, just allow the experiencing of what is present to be experienced. Now, usually if you are in strong states of fear, there's a very dualistic experiencing, i.e. you be very strongly identified with the body and the thinking. But for me, if you just allow yourself to experience the emotion and detach from thoughts, then that should start to weaken. So the energy of it starts to get weaker and weaker. And then as, you, as you're disidentifying from thoughts, then it's like you, you, you know, if you can get really advanced at it, if you can do it enough, then you'll start to lose, you know, your body identification, you'll start to lose identification with location and time. So you'll start to get into these more expansive, limitless states. So that's one of the prime tools I use. And in fact, if I have a very strong emotion, often I'll do that one first, just to release the energy of it. The other thing to do... So can I just recap? So that first one is the feeling... I call it, I, I, I call it feel the feelings. Mm. That's how I sort of frame it. It's just not, not identify with thoughts. And I'm just like saying, oh, I've got, there's too much energy which has not been experienced out. So I'm just sort of sitting with it and just allowing it to just evaporate off and try, try not to distract off into thought activities. And as, you, as it evaporates off, then you can start, one, can start to, one will start to find that the experiencing of limitation starts to dissolve. Like it's no longer just in the location in the stomach. It sort of more becomes more, um, more um, <clears throat> what's the word? It becomes more diffuse, you know, and the, body's, the, set, the location of the body becomes more diffuse as this energy becomes lighter and lighter. Then you can start to, because I've been doing a lot of practice, to start to let go of identification with the body, identification with time, identification with location. So you're going to these more limitless states of experiencing. So that's that for me is one of the things I do. The other thing to, to do... Yeah? Can I just ask about that? So what I find with that though is that sometimes when there is this feeling and it's so strong, it's just too hard to be with. Mm. It feels like too impossible to be with. And I have mm. found just recently in these difficult times I've had recently, there were flashes of moments of like awareness that this is really, this is here, this is feeling is here and um, find the gold in it or be, be with it. Or, so, and when I was able to do that, yeah, that's when there was some kind of transformation I mm. find. But actually a lot of the time when it happens, it's too much, so I do something or I, you know, will be lost in thinking of it or I'll be lost in doing because to be with is feels too 
um, challenging. Well, he, I mean, I think that this is, you know, I, I can definitely relate. Of course, yeah. it's the worst thing. I mean, one doesn't want to be with a strong feeling. And one, mm. the ego will offer up, any, do anything except mm. be with it. So that, that's the normal. I think what really, really helped me with this was um, my teacher, Dr. Hawkins, who was saying it's such a golden opportunity mm. when you have a mm. really strong feeling yeah. to do the absolute opposite of what mm. you want to do. And it was the mindset that, you know, if, if you've ever had these spiritual experiences, the, you know, the way you're going to make fastest progress is to develop an attitude that when the feelings are extremely strong, you really want to go through them. Mm -hmm. And it was having that spiritual teacher sort of say that to me, which ha made me have the reverse attitude of what was my usual tendency. As an addict, you know, I was in food addiction and, and in heavy thinking and, and the ego. My, my tendency was never to experience anything that's difficult. And so, listening to Hawkins, it was like, actually, if I really want to be a, uh, a, a spiritual seeker, then I have to adopt one, the 180 opposite. So it's like, every opportunity where I have an extreme feeling is an opportunity where I want to sit with it and, and go through it, hopefully, t at least for like 10 or 20 minutes. I think when there are extreme feelings, um, it seems like you're going to be with it forever until it passes. So, I, you know, if I can do like 20 minutes a day or, uh, you know, but if I have the time to do an hour or two hours, I mean, I think I've spent up to like, I think when I used to have my gout attacks, I'd have these horrific pains in my feet. I'd spend three or four hours just sitting down and just experiencing. And then it, and then it would go from pain in the foot and then it would start to dis dissipate after an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours. And then eventually, like I wasn't aware of even it being in my foot. It was more like a, dis a diffuse serenity. And then after a while, that diffuse serenity went into this kind of blissful peace, you see. So when I had the time, I'd just spend three or four hours until it was completely gone. And I think those type of things really have transformative effects if you can go from something which is really horrific. And each time it's like when I had those attacks or symptoms or those strong feelings, I did that. And it becomes like, it's like the consciousness starts to have a different attitude. Mm. You know, you're training the consciousness like strong feelings, experience it out and surrender and allow it. And um, whereas, um, you know, so you're actually reversing what is the ego's attitude, which is to avoid and to think mm. and to distract. And, uh, and also, in, instinctively and intuitively, it's kind of obvious that's the fastest way to let it go, is to confront it 100% and not run away. So I, I want to, just by sitting down, it's like, I, you know, I can't be like running and doing some exercise or trying to do a house chore. So sitting down for me is very confrontational to experiencing something very loud. And then, of course, then the next thing is, if you're sitting down with your eyes closed, is to just distract into thinking enormously, to not experience it. And so, developing, I think it's a good question, yeah. In the early days, of course, it was extremely difficult, because that's like a 180 opposite attitude. But I think just sitting with these, and just every time you're, the practice was to, you know, the thing would be, you'd, you, when you have loud feelings, you want to go into thinking a lot. That's the tendency to gravitate to extreme fast thinking. But it's just to like detach from the thoughts and just be with the feeling. And then you're off into another thought, detach, bring yourself back, just be, allow, allow the feeling, then another thought. But just doing that all the time, regularly, with the different, when I had those huge feelings in my early days, then starts to have a, a, like a consciousness tendency so that you become more and more, it becomes easier and easier. And actually the backlog because one of the things that actually um, uh, is that you realize that unless you do this, your spiritual work on a regular basis, it's going to start accumulating again, these huge energies. And then they usually manifest in these difficult, either physical symptoms or life situations. So it's really, really good. It's like, you know, the metaphor would be like vacuuming your house. You know, if you when you're really got a messy house and you spend you know like a few months vacuuming until it's clean, you know you get a lot of relief. But if you don't like do the odd vacuum every now and then, 
it can really start to get dilapidated again. So I sort of see sitting with those feelings on a regular basis uh, as being uh, really important. Mm. Um, but it is difficult. I, I'm asking, I'm saying, it, yeah, of course, for someone in a lot of feelings, that would, what I've just said would be the most difficult thing to do. But for me, it's like if you're a spiritual, if you're a spiritual student, then, you know, like, well, I speak for myself. It's like I want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. You know, I, I, if I can, if there's one thing, what, what for me is complete surrender? Complete surrender would be sitting and trying to detach from thoughts and 100% experiencing it without escaping. Just allowing it 100%. Don't even go, you know, detach from the thoughts. So you're purely experiencing it. It's almost like you're welcoming, allowing what has been repressed and suppressed by the ego and what the ego never wants to be experienced, to fully let it come out and experience it. And you're developing in that way, uh, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, spiritual muscle. You're developing spiritual muscle. It's like when the ego says, don't experience life now, it's too difficult, or think, or put the TV on, or don't sit and experience that energy. You're developing the spiritual muscle of, you know, you're not afraid of your ego. You know, it's like when I was going through, I often share with other when I was going through food addiction, not, not picking up and experiencing my food, I had panic attacks. It was so extreme. And the ego didn't want to experience all that stuff because it, it was under threat for spiritual experience to actually face that and not run away until it, it goes. Um, so I just sort of share it. And I, I think the thing that I would answer to that is that it's like, it's like facing your demons, you see. It's like um, the ego is saying, whatever you do, put the TV on, or just think, or go off into fantasy, or eat, eat a cake or something. And it's like, so it's like, that's like the, you know, I shouldn't say the word devil, but it's like the, um, the ego's cunning, trying to get you from having a real spiritual experience, that if you, if you allow that, you know, you're inviting in grace mm. to come in. So the, it's the ego's enemy to really surrender and allow the potentiality of divine grace to enter the situation. So it's the fastest call to, to, to grace. Um, that's one of the things I do. Um, the other thing I do is self-inquiry. Um, now, I think self-inquiry, like a lot of people say, it's difficult to do self-inquiry when you have a loud feeling, but I think it's always worth a try. And, uh, you know, to ask um, if there's a lot of fear or anxiety coming up uh, or there's a lot of thinking about fearful outcomes around money or security or whatever it is, is to ask, it's not ask the question, it's like, you know, symbolically ask the question, what's observing the fear and the thoughts and the stories and the images? So, some t and then to keep, or whatever is being experienced, what you know, what's observing the fear in the stomach, what's observing the the fearful fantasies that I won't have enough money to to pay the rent next week, you know, next next month. So then one starts to just in in that it's like, you know, I'll quote the thing that Saint Francis says, because Saint Francis says is what you're looking for is where you're looking from, which is like the observer. Can you say it slowly? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Just in there, what you. What you're looking for is where you're looking from. So when the... Uh, yeah, so what you're looking for is where you're looking from. So salvation or God's light or grace is the place of looking from. And what everyone is really looking for is the place of looking from. So looking at the ego's the feelings and the thoughts and the stories and the egos the ego is just making projections that the solution is in more thinking or more external action or trying to escape the feeling so that's um that's you know so that that's like look you know rather than looking at the pl being in the place from where it's all happening and where it's all being observed one is now in the 
in the story of the ego and looking for external solutions. So it, it's a bit like, you know, you could say it's a bit like you're, um, you're a character on a cinema screen who believes your character is real and then the character has got a problem with all the other characters in the cinema screen and is thinking how the cinema screen should be changed. Uh, so the, the character, and you believe the character on the cinema screen, which is your ego, is a real character, and that ego is then looking at the other bits on the cinema screen and trying to figure out what to do within the cinema screen. And all of that is, is, not, is, like, is never going to work, because you have to be in the place which is looking from. You know, and where is the place that's looking from? It's like the projector. So the projector, which is, you've got the film and the light going through the film, you know, the light is the source. And that's the place you need to be, the looking from place, rather than to be on the cinema screen, being a character in the screen, and trying to figure out what in the screen needs to happen. So... So the, 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 the fear is like, a, you could say, a projection of duality and the body is a projection of duality and all the future projections into the future and the past and all the characters and all the, thi all the events, that's still all part of the um, cinema screen. So that's not what you're really looking for. The solution is not in that area. The solution is in the place of looking from. So what's witnessing all of this which is not related to any of this? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like detaching. You know, it's like, oh, you're in the attachment to the emotions, you're, you're identified with the emotions, you're identified with the thoughts. But actually there's a place of grace or stillness or witnessing or observing, which is the divine, which is divinity. Because divinity or grace is not identified with all, it can't be identified with this, it's in a different it's a different level of consciousness. This stuff doesn't even exist in that place. So it's like it's immediately, it's like letting go of the ego's hooks to creating its uh, dualistic perception. And then you, you can be catapulted into, into the light in that way. But for me, practically speaking, it's a, it's a different, like when I'm engrossed in my ego, in my feelings in the body, in my thoughts, uh, then it's like it's like a hypnosis, and just the question, you know, what's observing, what's observing the thoughts and the duality and the body and all the stories, it's like an invitation to to disidentify, and uh, it's like a call to grace to God. Can I be in your presence, the presence before my absorption in the insanity of duality, if that makes sense. So, so often when I, just by saying it, I can, I can now experience a space or a presence which is, not, uh, which is not the thought identification or the body identification. You go into these more limitless fields of experiencing. So, so, that's, so, there's, so there's feeling the feelings, I'll call that a tool. There's what's observing this, or it could be like sticking on a YouTube video of Muji. Um, you know, like Muji is currently doing. Uh, he, now, the observer was a thing. He's now Muji is actually going off into something slightly different. He's calling it the invitation, and the, the invitation is available on YouTube. It's like a it's like a little YouTube clip of Muji, and so he's doing it in a different way to self inquiry, which is that he's just basically saying like let go, let go of your thoughts of the future. Right in this moment, like let go of all thoughts of the future and let go of all thoughts of the past and let go of any projection that you're having in the present moment. You don't have to label or make any story or thought up of the present moment. And then he's asking like, okay, if you've done that, let go of all the thoughts, future, past and present. Let go of anything, let go of your identity, just for now, just let go of even all thoughts of your identity then what is being experienced? If you let all of that go now, what is what you're experiencing now in form? Is it in, in form? Is in it, form? Has it got a shape? Is it an object? If you let everything go now, is what you are, is it an object? Is it a thought? Is it, has it got a location? 
So you check in with yourself. Have you let go of everything? What's your nature? And if you drop everything, are you experiencing something which is um, limitless, beyond shape, beyond form, beyond time? Do you recognize something now? So that's the other. And if you do recognize something which is not, your th which is not thought, which is not the body, which is not a shape, which is not a passing feeling, if you're recognizing something now, then just allow yourself just to rest in that. Just be that thoughtless, timeless, shapeless experiencing and just, just rest in that. So that's the other way he's doing that. So you just recognize, you know, no, it's clear. I'm not the thought, I'm not a shape, I'm not in time. So there's a kind of a silence that you recognize and just just rest in that silence. So that's another way. The other things are um, A Course in Miracles. Um, and as I've shared, you know, I like, you know, one of the things with Course in Miracles is it can ask you, and even if it's not asking you, I recommend setting a timer or an alarm or something regularly throughout the day to just remind you to do either a Course in Miracles lesson or just to observe or detach from whatever you're hooking into regularly throughout the day, that, that is good. In terms of financial, um, in terms of uh, fear around money and finances, is the thing, you know, one of the lessons, um, and this is the way I do it, and I think other people may disagree, but that's fine, is, I mean, one of the lessons from A Course in Miracles is God, you know, I think God is the strength in which I trust. And for me, meaning God is the source of my security. Uh, so money is not, you know, for me, money is not the source of security. It's, you know, to what extent, uh, what grants me grace and gives me all the things that are required for, uh, in life is my connection to the divine. So the greater that, the more the universe will provide and care in mystical ways, in terms of money, in terms of, you know, even like, you know, uh, my view is God will even provide a home to live in, money to pay for things in the most mystical Yes, you know, I'm not saying that one doesn't take action, but I'm saying holding on to the fear and the excessive thinking, negative thinking around it is actually tying you to the lower vibrations, which means things are more likely to go wrong. If I'm holding on, let, let's say I had a great fear like um, I'm not going to have enough money to pay the rent or I need to get money for, in this way to pay the rent, then for me that would be... Um, that would be a fearful thought with a fearful energy. I'd want to... This doesn't negate taking actions uh, in, in the real world for that, but I'd really want to let go of my thoughts and obsession around it and the energy of the fear, because for me this will block off divine intervention or may mean the situation is stuck. So, yeah, at the moment, um, one of the things I'm doing, if, I, if I'm just sort of sharing where I'm at with all of this, is just I don't want to be I don't want to be thinking about thoughts of the future or the past. If I have to take actions, then I take the actions. But it's like holding, you know, just staying in the present moment, just be in the here and now. Even when if you have to take some actions around money, take them. But then after you've taken those actions, just the thing is just to be in the here and now, just to be present. And one of the things with that, what am I saying? I mean, there's no necessity to engage in thinking. You know, and to trust an, an intuition, if you have to take action, take those actions, and then avoid obsessing or thinking about it over and over again. Because when there's fear, certain thoughts are... Um, like if I had fear around money, then that thought becomes a special thought or a meaningful thought. And because I'm now giving it meaning and interest, that thought keeps rep repeating over and over. Oh, I've taken some action, but I may not still get the money. Then I'm thinking about it again and even more. So it's like, forget it. You know, after taking action, just it's like, just forget all thoughts. It's just like uh, fully being in the here and now. And it's like, and as soon as a thought tries to come in the here and now, just absolutely disregard it. It's like almost like there's a willingness to forget all thoughts and not engage in thoughts and just be silently present in every moment. 
And then that, that starts to gain an energy force. It's like you don't want to be thinking. You just want to be in stillness. So usually with actions, so that I'm not saying don't take actions to pay the, to earn money, but um, it's like taking actions in that way. Other things to do are, um, yeah, just, if you have favorite lessons from A Course in Miracles, um, I usually like twice a day get on my knees and pray. And, uh, and I also do a lot of Course in Miracle lessons at the same time. So um, I'll do, I, I go to 12 steps, I have 12 step prayers, like I'll have a fear prayer from the big book. Um, I'll say, you know, I could you do, that? yeah, yeah. Uh, God, I humbly ask you to remove my fear of paying the rent and direct my attention to what you'd have me, have me be, which is, to, which is to have faith and trust and that you guide me in all my actions around the situation, something like that, you see. So I could do the, that and then I could pray for a miracle to see my fear of money differently. I, I also do what I like doing, cancelling my belief. I cancel my belief that fear of money is a real thing. I'm an infinite being subject only to what I hold in mind. I cancel my belief I need my ego to sort the fear out. I'm an infinite being subject only to what I hold in mind. Um, it depends how I'm holding the fear, you know. Uh, I, I would also, like for myself, I would cancel my belief that money, money is the thing that will, will solve it. Actually, I've seen, you know, like, there's lots of ways situations get, can get resolved in different ways. Uh, but anyway, for me, it's like I have, being a part of this world, I've attached a lot of meaning that the more money I have, the more safe I am. Um, but actually, for me, it's like... The, I'd cancel my belief in that. I cancel my belief that money is the thing that is the source of my security. I'm an infinite being subject only to what I hold in mind. And then, you know, ha you know, it's because I intuitively for myself know that actually it's the connection to grace, it's the spiritual. That's the, that's the power that makes sure everything is always going well for me. It's not like how many green notes I've got because if I'm, if I'm doing that, then I'm energizing the ego more and more and then I'm making money more and more interesting the, the solution my salvation so it's not to take not to negate action but i don't want to invest it with so much meaning and energy that i'm blocking off just being connected and present so all the all the miracles you know um with the talking about the cause of miracles you know what i give meaning to is what i'm suffering from yes so when i make a thing more interesting and more meaningful i suffer more I get more and more disconnected. It's because I've made it, I've made money, I've made whatever it is, so meaningful that it's now blocking my connection to, to grace. So I want to make it meaningless. So I've described that, but also the Course in Miracles describes it, you know, just saying meaning it's meaningless, um, you know, having the intention that it's not going to be so meaningful to you. And, you know, for me, the thing is, like, the ego may say, if it has no meaning, then I won't do anything. I mean, I, I would say, for me, actually, I, I, I actually find that the, the more meaningless a thing has been, the more I'm able to deal with it more effectively. It's like, it's just because um, it has no value. It's like divine grace and intuition operates, in my experience, more effectively. You know, and actually when it has more meaning, my ego is more involved, there's heavier emotions, and actually things go more things. So it's like, if you made, um, if you made a table absolutely meaningless to your ego, so that you don't think about it ever, it doesn't mean that you actually you can effectively use a table when you need to use it. It just hasn't got the baggage attached to it, you see. So, so money doesn't become imbued with magical or, or like... Uh, the qualities of God. It just becomes a functional thing, but it's not attributed with the thing that saves you. And that means that you can stay in that pure presence all the time. And things are just functional, but they're, they're not imbued with me. And that, that again leads to another Course in Miracles lesson. Like I see only the past in everything I see. And this then creates a kind of a sticky backlog, which then creates emotions and fears. Whereas if they're meaningless, they become they can become functional. But actually, grace, or the or the presence, is the thing that is you know saving one's life. 
also I think if there are areas which are stuck those are the things that you have to you have to really spiritually work on because while you're staying in fear and heavy thought identification those things are likely to keep staying stuck so that the energy of stuckness holds it so you need to to release it in that way um, yeah does that answer that okay.